All right, so welcome to Alex Spicer Podcast. I'm your Freedom Specialist today, and uh, I wanted to share with you uh, just a little bit of a little bit of thoughts when it comes to before we jump into some awesome guests that we have today. I just want to share a couple of thoughts when it comes to uh, the tragedies that we've seen in London. Now, what we saw with uh, with having a car being used to to plow down people, and then men with knives getting out and uh, and attacking people, it, it, yes, it's it's a tragedy, and, and we all recognize it's a tragedy, but uh, I couldn't help but feel very concerned that um, <laughs> that the police officers in, in that incident were yelling at the people, telling them to run, but then also were running with the people because they didn't have any sort of weapons at all whatsoever to, to stop of what was happening. Uh, and there was one brave uh, police officer who tried to stop them with his, with his baton. But seriously, it, it really makes me feel concerned. Like, okay, why don't they have weapons, and, including the people? Why don't they have weapons as well? You find yourself in a place where people are literally coming at you. And I think every American should honestly feel so grateful that we have something called the Second Amendment, that that, that we have something like that that can protect us from from harm, from people injuring us. And actually, I truly believe that, um, you know, like many founding fathers have said, I, I really believe that having weapons, having us, you know, owning weapons, owning guns, and, and being disciplined enough to use them, has kept many atrocities at bay. It's it's really it's a really simple solution, and all it takes is some very very minor training. It's very easy to learn, um, but never at any point should we ever think that. Uh, I was really actually really disgusted the fact that there was a lot of news stations saying, "Wow, that that run tell that run hide and tell policy saved many lives." Uh, no, it didn't, um, because that's a natural human response. If someone's gonna come kill you, you're gonna run. You're going to hide, and you're going to tell people who have guns or who have some sort of way of stopping them to come and help you. So uh, the, the, the idea that that's some sort of policy is ludic ludicrous. It's like, <laughs> yeah, it's such a great policy to save people, except seven people died that probably could not have died if, if even just the police officers alone had guns on them. But instead, you have people having to resort to their natural human prehistoric instincts, essentially. There's there's nothing there's nothing smart or wise about that. It, it's ridiculous. So I I honestly think if you're going to engage in any sort of conversation with people when it comes to guns, when it comes to uh, uh, your Second Amendment rights, just recognize the fact that these weapons are tools. And yes, we can use them for hunting, but they're primarily uh, meant for us to use to protect ourselves, either from a tyrannical government or what has come to mind more recently is uh, personally my own fear about this whole thing is that uh, I, I haven't necessarily been afraid that the government is going to become uh, super imposing tyrannical, where it's like, crap, grab your guns, here we go. Um, that's that's more rare. What I've been more afraid of is of us becoming more like Europe, where it's a peaceful, a peaceful tyrannical government, meaning they disarm us peacefully and then we, we rest all of our hopes and desires for, for safety and protection in the arms of our noble officers who they themselves have no capability whatsoever of protecting us. And then you end up with incidents all across Europe where where uh, evil men are, are um, they are empowered, they're encouraged to attack you. Why? Because you have no sort of defense against you. And the, the state can't protect you either because they, they're going to show up oh so late. You're gonna you're gonna get there late. So, I believe that uh, it's it's necessary for us to to recognize that th these are tools and we're meant to use them, whether for against a tyrannical government or whether just to protect ourselves from those who would terrorize us. But now that that's my little spiel on the London attack. I want to start by introducing our first guest today. His name is Daryl Spicer, and actually. Uh, Daryl and I go way back. He's actually my uncle, and I, I didn't realize until recently just how politically involved uh, you are, Daryl. So, Daryl, are you still there on the line? I am. I'm here. How are you doing today? Good. Good. Beautiful day down here. Uh, and and you're, you're over uh, in Boise, Nampa? Yeah, Boise, Nampa area. I'm down in Idaho, so in Idaho. Awesome. Do you mind uh, Do you mind sharing with the audience uh, some of the experience uh, that you have had uh, in in your uh, in the what offices? I've done? That well, you, yeah, the things you've done. Well, as far as politically, I was talking to my wife last night. I guess I've, even as a kid, I was 
uh, interested in politics, history, geography, that kind of thing. As as young as uh, 12, I think I was sent to the state house to do a to meet with the governor and and uh, the legislature, and then report back to our uh, classroom on how the government operates and that kind of stuff. So now I think about, it, I guess it's been many many years, but I've always been inclined that way. I've never been really deeply involved. It kind of uh, when I moved here to Idaho, well actually in California, I got involved. Um, in uh, politics down there, I was at the 96th convention uh, in San Diego, and also I uh, was heavily involved in um, two things that uh, I was involved in. One was the marriage, uh, to get the marriage amendment passed in California to affirm marriage, the first round. Most people are familiar with the second round. We did a first round, um, and that was quite an experience, uh, quite a bit of uh, uh, flack from that, from the crowd uh, that wanted it to not happen. And uh, then um, the other one I was involved in down there is we did the recall on Governor Gray Davis, uh, who was uh, extremely liberal. And then uh, at that point, I was uh, realized it was time to get out of California because they were going to head down a path that I couldn't follow. And so last thing we did uh, as the group I was with was we uh, got, got him recalled. In the meantime, I was also doing uh, voter clinics for every election. I would get uh, bunch of people together and go over. In California, they got a lot of ballot issues, and they get very creative. They'll put two ballot issues on there, and and they they twist them around to the point where if you say if you say yes, it really means no, and vice versa. So you really had to go through what they meant and how they were going to vote on them. And so we would do that, um, and maybe stick to the issues. We do a little bit of um, the uh, politicians if they wanted to, but mainly try to deal with just their stances and not their personalities, and stick with the principles and what's really it. At bay there, and you know, what it, what's at uh, stake there? So anyway, we got Gray Davis out, and then uh, on the way out, they nominated um, Arnold Schwarzenegger, and I couldn't believe that we were basically getting rid of a liberal and getting another one. But that's <laughs> California, so I fled to Idaho. I'm a political refugee. That's the way I look at it. <laughs> and uh, Idaho is pretty good uh, as far as politically. They've got some of their challenges as well, but. When I became here, I also started looking into what more I could do than just vote. I've voted in pretty much every election that I'm aware of, including bond measures. I think I've only missed two or three in my entire life from 18 on. Um, and that's the off-cycle off, uh, elections and stuff. Uh, but when I got here, I was listening to Phyllis Schlafly one time, I think, from the Eagle Forum. She would mentioned that you might want to get involved in becoming a precinct committeeman. That's the people who are the grassroots of the party. They, they're the ones that hand out flyers. and and uh, also um, vet uh, candidates and stuff. And so I got involved there. That, I didn't realize that was an elected position, but because of my connections, I got elected, I think, three times for two-year terms, two or four-year terms. I mean, I think it was two-year terms, uh, three or four times there. And uh, this last round, I got, I got a little disillusioned with the Republican Party. I've never been a, a staunch uh, partisan in any way. I've kind of been an open-minded person try to, you know, more more the issues than the person, but I've been a very strict, try to consider myself a strict constitutionalist, and uh, from my opinion, neither party was following it, so I decided to back off a little bit, and then the, right now I'm just seeing what I can do as far as issues that might help um, get us more back in that direction. So anyway, but in that uh, position, I interacted with a lot of the uh, politicians from both from my area. Wow. Pretty much on a, at least a face recognition uh basis with the governor and most of our senators. If I go to the state house, they pretty much know who I am, and I can just move, move my way around there. I guess I'd be a great uh, lobbyist, but um, I don't want to lobby for anything but freedom, and so that's kind of where I'm at now. Just uh, I step back, and I'm, I still vote. I still active as much as possible on the issues, but I'm trying to look at the bigger picture. What can we do as a state, a county, and uh, even a country as far as getting back to some sanity? So that's kind of where I'm at now. Well, that's awesome. That's <laughs> that's quite a bit of experience. Um, I, I actually I want to I want to ask you about the experience you had with um the the government getting so much involved in marriage in California. You said you know we're more aware of the second time second go around, which I, I'm assuming you you're referring to Proposition Eight. Um, you're right. So uh, with the first go around, uh, in comparing it to what you saw and maybe what you might have heard about the second go around, uh, do you feel like there was there was a considerable oh, difference. All the differences? Yeah. Yeah, well, what, what happened the first time we went around, I believe, if I could, my memory serves me right, I think we, we passed it at 66%. The second time it went through, it still passed, but it was only like, it got down. So you could tell the people were 
their minds were being changed by the uh, propaganda going out there. So I think it passed, if I'm not mistaken, around 55, 58 percent, something like that. So it went down a bit. Um, as to the players, uh, when I was out there doing it, um, I got threatened and my car trashed and stuff like that by the other side because wow. I found out early early on that they are not interested in tolerance. They're interested in getting their point point made and getting what they want at all else. And so they, they have a, a mentality that this sounds a little harsh, but it's it's kind of a, almost a fascistic mentality that's very similar. I see, and when you're out here in the dealing with this, you see a lot of the similar type men, mentalities. I see, and this might sound harsh again, but I see the same mentality in the ISIS type people. They have no intention of getting along with anybody. They merely want to. You're going to follow their path or else. And uh, the homosexual lobby. And I'll give you a case in point. You. People probably heard about the bakers and the cake makers who have been sued and yeah. and the camera uh, photographers. Well, under the Constitution, they have a right to refuse service. It's their business. They can do whatever they want. Um, but the lobby went after them with the idea that they're going to put them out of business. And the one over here in Oregon, they're trying to take her house. Uh, or I think it's a couple there. They're trying to take the house and make an example of them. And to me, that's a fascistic mindset. It's not that you injured us and we want uh, recompense. It's that we want to make a statement to everybody out there that you're going to follow our path or else. And so there's a lot of that out there, and there's a lot of that polarization going on today. Um, and then uh, another thing I should mention in California, we also got another one passed uh, before that marriage one, and that was on um, uh, denying uh, welfare benefits to illegal aliens. Now, from a constitutional perspective, they're not citizens. They're not, doesn't have a right to them. It makes sense. It passed overwhelmingly. I think we had like nearly... 80% on that. And then immediately they sued and went to a judge, um, a judge shop, and put our uh, our ballot measure on until she decided to make a ruling. Well, as far as I know to this day, she's never made a ruling, so that uh, has been on hold. The case in point being that I found that when even when we got good issues passed, there's other moving parts, and uh, these people are very good at finding loopholes in order to, much like uh, uh, Trump's order to halt the uh, immigration, you know, they find a judge shop and they find somebody to put a hold on it. And then, and that gets me back to where we as people, we have to be aware of, um, th does this judge or any judge for that matter really have a right to put a hold on that and to basically negate the will of the people? Now, uh, democracy by itself isn't a good thing, but we do have that as part of our system. And when, you know, uh, one judge overrules millions of people in California, for instance, or uh, elsewhere, there's a problem in the system. And so we as people need to understand, do they really have a leg to stand on? And what is the, you know, what's the constitutional ramifications and cultural ramifications of those type of things? So I probably ramble on too long. No, no, Go ahead. It, it, it's very, it's very true that um, you have uh, all sorts of violations of, of just constitutional law, right? I mean, the Constitution is meant yeah. to be very bare bones. It's not meant to make the government uh, encroaching as it is today. However, uh, right. we're not even, there's not even necessarily a violation of the, of the, um, uh, encroachment of federal law. It's the it's the violation of constitutional law, right? Like you were saying, how the judges would overturn the will of the people. And I like how you, you talked about, you know, democracy uh, isn't necessarily always a good thing. And and that's actually something, uh, just a side tangent that drives me nuts is that people always go, you know, you know, this is our democracy. Well, I think honestly, our founding fathers would roll over in their graves to hear us say democracy because they're like, it's republic, right? It's a republican democracy. Yeah. yeah. Because yep. if you're purely a, a democracy then by all means our presidential elections and every other election would be uh, purely for uh, based on on the majority vote but there's a reason why you know why we it, it's it's set up differently so that way we can actually keep ourselves from from going off the edge from you know just the, you can get plenty of groups of people who are just mindless and brainless when it comes to these sort of issues who are and, and are willing right. to intimidate others kind of like the examples you shared with um with you know getting your car trash and and threatened uh, yeah. during during that that time in California yeah you can whip people into an emotional fr fit frenzy to get some things happen in the short term but you're right they put those elements in there i would like to clarify as far as our constitution we are a constitutional republic with representatives there are elements of democracy in it because democracy is one person, you know, one person a vote kind of thing, and that isn't bad as long as it's controlled, and that's what the founding fathers did. Yeah, you're right. Just like the election, you know, the 
electoral college is our savior in this case because it they controlled and balanced the the, uh, the you know democracy against a, a true representative government, and that's what the outcome was. And so uh, the little guy isn't squelched. His hopefully his rights are uh, are upheld as much as the majorities because that's what can happen. The majority can bleed out there and take over all kinds of rights under you know just a might be the emotion of the moment. And uh, government's supposed to move very slow and very deliberative, and that's for a reason, because our rights are, first of all, they're God-given. And anybody to take those away, it's not a small thing. And that's why, the, again, that's why a lot of these, our officers take the oath to the Constitution. That oath is supposed to mean something. And uh, in days of old, you could, be, you could be tarred and feathered and in some cases hung in the public square for violating your oath if it was that clear. So, you know, we've come a long ways. Most people don't even know. Um, you know where we're at today and how far off these people are but yeah you know, right so. we're we're so so many of us are so focused on privileges rather than rights right that that we can we mix it oh, yeah. you know? like the the common sentiment i find across people of of all types in america including people that i would have assumed to have been more uh i don't want to say intelligent but i do say intelligent because i thought they had more knowledge in this or more intelligence but yeah. the, the the common sentiment they'll say is well the supreme court already said it's okay right the government made it legal so it's okay i'm like yeah but they also yeah. made it legal to own slaves so like they, yeah you know, like it, it's it's they they create government into their god right well look god yeah. says it's okay but they like government being their god because they can they can manipulate it any way they want once they uh can can wield that power you know through voting and then get in there with lobbying all sorts of stuff so yeah, it, it, yeah. and that's that's the danger that's the danger if you can get uh, as the founders talked about factions if you can get certain factions combined together to, and to overwrite rights then we're in a very dangerous place and that's that's where we're at today but see also in the constitution what the constitution really is uh, we always harp on it what is it well it's really go you got to go back to the declaration of independence and read what the constitution is how we get it done but it really is, gets down to co uh, common and uh common rights common law that we all have among us based on those rights and that's why people really need to understand that we all have these equal and common rights and when people start overcoming those and and wiping those off first amendment second amendment, whatever you want to call it uh letting like you talked earlier uh, the guns guns aren't about hunting they're the right to protect yourself that's an equal right we all have so you can't in um take that away without some ramifications and the ramifications are very serious well i see what's going to happen from what i my perspective is if they keep pushing this people also understand that their rights uh, people understand at a fundamental re uh, level their rights. Uh, take the uh, cake maker or the, or the photographer who was forced, uh, going to be forced to uh, not, it, okay, so he didn't do the wedding, but he was forced to take sensitivity classes and now his house is being taken because of, you know, all of us at a gut level know that that's just wrong. Yeah. That's just wrong. And what's going to happen, my fear is eventually if they keep pushing this stuff, not just those people, but any people who are pushing these rights things that, like you said, are really privileges, there's going to be a backlash eventually, and it's going to be basically another civil war because people are going to take it so long. Um, you're seeing that a little bit in Britain with Brexit and this, um, and uh, people getting really upset with these last two attacks. And it, I, you don't blame them, you know, like what you said, you know. We want a right to protect ourselves, or we want um, because, you know, over in Europe, frankly, uh, Poland and Hungary are two countries that don't let any of these people in, and guess how many attacks they have? Zero. Yeah. Very few. And so the empirical evidence is there, but all it does is it backs up our gut feelings. And our gut feelings is our conscience or whatever that we know. And uh, people will only go so far, and then there will be a backlash. And my concern is that it, it goes too far, and then we get you know get to a shooting match or something. So. Oh That's yeah, it becomes more like the French Revolution, right? Where it, it, it right. becomes, it becomes t uh, anarchical. It just <laughs> yeah, and I think today we'd be, be more like the French Revolution than the American Revolution, which is you know based on something. I think there's a certain percentage of people who would base it on God and principles and rights, but there's a lot of bigger percentage who just based on we're the top strong man in the room, we're going to take what we want, and that's a bigger danger. Absolutely. Obviously, so. it's, it's, that, it's that valuing of emotions more than principle, right? Where it, oh, yeah. it's more yeah, exactly. about exactly. And actually, that's that's a yeah. really good segue into kind of the next topic I wanted to talk to you about, uh, which is education, because I, I feel like 
uh, even if even if let's say there's no grand design, it's really easy to look at uh, the evil that goes on, the progressives, and what they do in the in the whole spectrum of years. It's so easy to look at it and go, it looks like a perfectly laid design because all these things work together and they lead to where we are today. But even if it's not that, you have to admit to the fact that. You look at what happens in the education system and how that for years now has been valuing emotions far more than anything else. And, the, and now you have people with such low emotional intelligence that all they want are handouts and they'll do anything for anyone who's willing to just placate their, you know, their whining desires. What would you say uh, was probably the first thing you noticed entering into the education system that, that led to the education well, system to where it is today? Well, you're right. You're right. And you see that today. Uh, they're being conditioned. They're being conditioned to um, basically get a participation trophy for just showing up. And they're being conditioned. And a lot of them are being passed through the system without being uh, really knowing the knowledge because the teachers just want to get these, quote, dummies out of the system rather than cater to the way they learn. That's another whole story. But with the, quote, safe spaces, they can't even, these uh, snowflakes, as they call them, can't even handle somebody with a uh, uh, different idea than theirs coming into their presence. They just they go to pieces, and so therefore they're being conditioned to basically be uh, just animal farm. I don't know how else to do it. I mean, they basically you just you do this and do this, and we're going to take care of you. And and if anybody uh, comes around and tells you something different, you just fly off the handle, you know. And and that's just it's a, again, it's a dangerous situation. The education system. Um, if you're looking about. Uh, taken over a country culturally, which is much easier than doing it uh, militarily, which has been the case in the United States. No country's really ever uh, attacked us outside, you know, Pearl Harbor, okay, you could say that, but really nobody's attacked us here. And the reason is, is not just because we're, you know, we're isolated based on our oceans, there's a lot to that, but also they understand that we're free men and you don't attack free men and take away their rights uh, without a, expecting a fight. You know, yeah. And that's been, that's been true throughout history. Well. Way back when, I think the communists looked at America, they always wanted to knock us off anyway because they're competing in ideology. So I think they decided that uh, what's the best way to attack us wouldn't be to attack them but it, because we're strong as well, but to go in and culturally change the culture. And that's what they did years ago with the founders of education. And uh, uh, if you go back in the educational movement and how it became mandatory in all these states and stuff, you'll find some of the, the movers and shakers that started that were all very avowed socialist and they had that same idea in mind to create a basically cattle. We want to take away the individuality and replace it with conformity and that's what their their drive has been all along. Uh, until we get to the point today, like you said, we're probably uh, so far beyond where these kids are like saying they can't even deal with a, an idea that's outside of their what they've been conditioned uh, to understand and so our education system isn't so much an education system as, as an indoctrination camp. I don't know how else to say it any nicer. But if you look at it, that's what it is. It's not about a you know, bunch of ideas put together and you come up with the truth. It's not a pursuit of truth per se. It's a pursuit of uh, an end. And that end is to make people into cattle. And I, again, I don't mean to offend people who have been through the education system, but as I have myself. But it took me a lot, a lot of years to look back and say, you know, this is where I got that idea and that idea. And I would encourage people just to look at your ideas that you hold. Like you said, you've talked to some that you thought, wow, they should, you know, they should have different thoughts, ask them where they got those ideas. Yeah. In most cases, it'll come from our education system because they've been con conditioned into it. What we can do about our education system, I don't know. Uh, at this point, um, again, education, um, I think it should be uh, maybe, maybe not privatized, but I like the idea of vouchers and stuff and opening it up to some competition to where you get some, uh, um, some good uh, teaching uh, capabilities and skills in there because, again, uh, the system we have is one size fits all. If you have a child that learns by reading and one that learns by seeing and one that learns by doing, it doesn't matter, they're all going into the same system. And uh, therefore you have some that have trouble, they struggle with school. So what you need to do is get uh, approaches that work for them. The other thing too is with the schools, uh, the biggest thing is, is that America was founded uh, on the Constitution, so that should be taught as well as where that comes from, that your rights come from God. Well, if you can take God out of the curriculum, which is what they've done, then that puts into question your rights. Do you really have rights? You only have rights if I give them to you because I'm more powerful. No, the rights come from God, and you don't violate those without serious repercussions. But 
that's where we need to get back to. Can we get there? I don't know. It's a long, it's a long, hard. Yeah. It's been it, a long march to get us here. They did that on purpose. Well, yeah, it, it, Go ahead. it took a lot of uh, infiltration to uh, to get us to where we are today. And, and, but I, and I've actually been extremely amazed at just how pass, passive we've been. Right? It, it's been it's been in the news here and there, and we see it happening in our, in our own communities. When your parents, right? I, I, I was the kid growing up and experiencing this, but I, I still paid attention to what was going on in my own community and elsewhere, where you have all sorts of really bad uh, ideas and concepts and changes to curriculum, uh, but essentially indoctrination, like you were saying, uh, happening. But what, where were the parents, right? What, what did the parents do? Right? Right. We just yeah. we become so passive. Yeah. Why do you think we're so passive? Why do you think so many Americans just let it slip? Well, well I think there's a couple things that work here. And uh, certainly I'd admonish parents to be aware and to be on the school board. That's Because I've always been aware, and I'm not the type that tried to sit down. I'll get in their face. And that's one of the reasons I homeschool, because I told my wife earlier on, we, I'd probably be in jail if you don't, because I'm not going to sit down. And, you know, they'll probably <laughs> throw me in jail because I won't shut up. <laughs> but um, if you got you got to realize too that our whole society has been had the same culture imposed on us, uh, and and for the parents it's socialism. So we're basically we're we're uh, giving you a free school system, but we're going to tax the snot out of you to pay for it. So because there's all those expenses that go with it, guess what? Your taxes have to go up. So mom usually has to go out of the home as well as dad, and both both of you work just to pay the taxes and make the ends meet on your expenses. Um, and so, therefore, if both of them are working, they have less energy to go and sit in a school board meeting or to fight stuff. So there's, and I'm not saying that's necessarily an excuse. That might be a reason for a lot of the people. They just don't have the time to go. It's a lot of these protesters. The same thing. You'll see them in the streets. You got to realize a lot of those are paid by the other side. Yeah, but the working people in. don't have time to show up. Yeah, they get busted in. I was there, as a matter of fact, in San Diego when they busted them in. I saw it. But. Um, and I asked, I talked to them about getting paid. They were getting paid. They didn't care what they were there for. They didn't care what the sign they got paid. But on the other side, the mom and dad, they're working. The working stiffs don't have time to show up on a lot of this stuff. And so that's part of it. That's part of it, I think, uh, just to answer your question, is that, you know, it, like I say, maybe it's not an excuse, but it is a reason, an overarching reason that mom and dad don't have time. You know, and then the school boards do creative things sometimes. They'll have meetings that are during work hours and that kind of stuff. So, yeah. <laughs> But, yeah, we, as a parent, I would just encourage anybody who's listening, you really need to pay attention to your kid's um, curriculum because there is a lot of stuff in there that uh, – and, again, the other side of that coin is to be very clear on your principles and your beliefs and make sure that those things match. And if they don't, you really should say something. Get in there, get in there and say something. You know, you they might blow you off, but then you could make some choices based on that. You know, whether to go to a different school or get on the board yourself or whatever. But there's things you can do. Absolutely. So, so. Uh, I'm curious. Uh, what what do you think is the um, the driving thought behind people who are uh, who who oppose religion in schools or oppose any sort of prayer? What do you, what do you feel like the, the driving thought behind that is? Well, it's like I told you earlier. There's there's the hardcores who just kind of, eh, and it's the same a lot of these movements, but there's the hardcores that really want to change things. They want to get God, God out of there. Because if we can get God out of there, then where are rights come from? Well, then they come from whatever, the barrel of a gun if you want. That's what the communists yeah. or classics are saying. So I think there's some hardcores that do that. But I think it wouldn't be accurate to say they're all, all a bunch of commie hardcores because no. there's people who are just fellow travelers, what the communists like to call what are the, uh, useful idiots, people <laughs> who aren't paying attention, paying attention, and that's my, their words, not mine, but uh, they pay attention and they don't pay attention so much and they're willing to be manipulated and stuff. So I think anytime you have a core and then a group that are who cares and they're willing to be manipulated, you can start carrying the day. So that's a lot of what has brought it to pass in my and that's not true just of education, but a lot of our even our problems with political realm is you've got some of the hardcores that will push hard. But again, I, I would like to point out those people there are usually organized and well funded, and it's not an it's not an accident. I mean, our world is such that uh, it does tend to degenerate. You know, if you plant a garden and uh, you got to fight the weeds, so things do kind of degenerate. So we have a propensity towards that human nature to degenerate a little bit. But let no mistake be made, there are elements that have, have no des every desire in the world to change it to their what they want, their model, and they're willing to put their money and time into it. And then you combine that with the mass of people who just don't really pay attention. Uh, again, just to give you some contrast, 
even on the American Revolution on that side. People may not realize this, but uh, the people who actually went in there and fought was a very, very small majority or minority, and uh, a lot of the people were just kind of agnostic. They didn't really care. So there's a, always a amount of certain amount of people who are willing to drive the agenda. The question is, are we going to let them do it? And you know, they're coming at you on so many fronts. You got sometimes you got to pick your battles, but um, it, you need to pick them because it's your child and your life you know, at stake here, really, their livelihoods and everything. Absolutely, so, and um, so. Uh, Thinking about the American Revolution, something that uh, many historians, uh, accurate historians, I should say, have said is that mm -hmm. when it came to the revolution, uh, in general terms, one third of the people were for independence, one third were neutral, and one third were loyalists. And, uh, yeah, would and that's you say probably that's like, a, yeah, you, you think that's accurate, a representation of today? Actually, that's probably being generous if there was even a third for it. But yeah, but roughly, yeah, you could say that. And it kind of goes along with what's that old saying? There's some people who uh, watch what happens. Some people make things happen. The other people wonder what happened. <laughs> you know, it's probably it's kind of our human nature. There's always stuff going on because you know not everybody's interested in everything. But there are some certain things that we just need to be aware of, and and as people, we need to be. In other words, focus on the important things. There are some things that are very important to your. Yeah, again, how your life is lived and your kids and what you want for their future. Absolutely. So, so um, look, you know, like looking looking at uh, how how people respond to uh, any sort of um, uh, just focusing on religion real fast. Focusing uh, how people respond to religions uh, being mentioned at all. For example, if you talk about how you know our our founding fathers, you know, they really believed in God. You know, Thomas Jefferson, he, you know, people try to pr proclaim that he was totally atheist, except when he was president, he let uh, government houses being used on Sunday for, for church, you know, worship and everything. Right. Uh, yeah. how, how would you, how would you then approach someone? Uh, how would you, how would you talk to them about the truth, the facts of our actual founding um, without, I guess without jumping into all the all the you know the the heated rhetoric that that comes from the left. Ooh, good question, Alex. Oh, uh, wow. And I do that a lot. I I worked on the university, I, and I got torn out of classes and escorted really? off campus. So I I know that. Um, yeah, that's a tough one because if people have their, what is the old saying? It's not what you don't. It's not what you know. It's what you what you know that just ain't true. Yeah. And there's so much of that out there, and so. I don't know, and some people, and then the other thing is don't confuse me with facts, you know, I've got my little thing going on here. Um, it's hard, uh, because probably the best thing to do would be to steer them back to the, uh, you know, the founding documents and that kind of stuff, but uh, honestly, that's a good question. I don't, how do you really get through people, you know, how do you, basically, how do you persuade somebody, you know, how do you persuade somebody back to the truth, and, uh, you know, a lot of times, I'm of the opinion you need God's help, obviously, a lot of prayer. Yeah. Um, but uh, the other, other thing I can think of is just to act continually, pro proclaim truth in a loving, kind manner, um, but hold fast to your principles. At any chance you get, um, try to correct uh, what you see going on. And I guess with people, sometimes they might come to you with a, a an, you know, this person, this, you know, this photographer got sued for not. What do you think about that? And uh, yeah, I'm sure I got, and I got my opinions, and I can unload on. Sometimes I'll ask the answer that with a question. Usually the so I like to try and stay in control a little bit, not only for control, but also just to learn their minds a little bit. And uh, and also sometimes you can get people by asking. The, the right question. The quality of your question determines the quality of your answer. And uh, so, what you want to do is get them to a quality question. Was that really right for that person? You know, livelihood to be taken from because he didn't. Well, you know, no. I think in my my conscience tells me no that he has the right to do what he wants and what he doesn't want to do. And and if you need to, you could tell him. You know, what if a KKK member came and wanted to have him do his wedding with complete with all the burning crops and everything? Well, would he have a right to not? Yeah. Okay. So let's be consistent. Does he have a right not to do that? Yeah, okay. You know, and so you really almost got to bring it down to their level. You know, the same thing with uh, the business. You know, you can't put the guy out of business because, first of all, it's his business. He has the right to do it, number one. Number two, um, what if you run into a guy like that? Say you're Jewish and he won't do Jewish weddings. You know, let's take it out of your realm and put it in something that's 
neutral. Let's talk about, say, a Jewish wedding, and he won't do it. And he's really mad at him. What, what can you do uh, based on natural constitutional common law rights? Well, really, you can't do anything. It's his business. But what you can do is go start a wedding that caters to nothing but Jews if you want, and then, or everybody, for that matter, and put him out of business. That's the beauty of the free market system. I can put him out of business because I can say, I'm open-minded. I'll do all these weddings. And people would, after a while, say, you know what? This guy's you know, nicer guy. He's open-minded. I'm going to go to him. You put him out of business. That's the beauty of the free market. And you're, you have every right to do it. And he has every right to either change his mind or go out of business. See, that's the beauty of our system. But again, I think what you need to do sometimes, uh, in answer to your question, I guess, is you need to paint the ideal. <laughs> it is the ideal. I understand it. We haven't gotten there very often. But you need to paint the ideal because once they see it, like that example I just gave you, I think most people go, you know, you're right. If I had a business, I shouldn't be forced to do something I really disagree with. You know, if I hate KK people and I don't want to do it for them, I shouldn't have to do it. There you go. Yeah. So, you know, Get them to the point where, you know, they understand it on their level. And I think that's one. Same with, you know, politics or any of this stuff, even religion. you got to bring it back to their level. What, what's important to you or, 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 you know, we all have a conscience, except for the few of us, I suppose, that have, you know, done enough bad stuff. They burn it. But most people have a, a conscience. Let's get back to the conscious level, which on the conscious level, it jives a lot with common law. And that, what that basically says is that what's common to me is common to you as far as rights. I should have the same rights as you. Yeah. So. You know, that's the way I would do it is just get it back to you know, ask a lot of questions, see where they're at, then get it back to a point where they make them understand it on the visceral level where they could understand that. Again, I could tell that to an 11-year-old you know, or a 10-year-old. Hey, if, was it right for me to come take away your business if I don't like the way you do it? No, it's my business. Exactly. We all understand that at a base level. So let's start there and then work backwards. Well, in this case, why is it wrong? Well, now that you put it that way really isn't wrong you know it is wrong that they did it well good thank you you know that's the kind of thing that we need to get to but again i think it's you know like Stephen r covey said we got to seek to understand and then get the understanding and that's you know so a lot of times if you talk to people you know you might spout off like i think you'd mentioned earlier i talk to people i'm surprised that, that you know they don't see things that way well part of it's the conditioning they've been in you need to go help them <laughs> get back back on the straight path you know but, you know, do it again with love and kindness. Um, sometimes they're family members. You have to live with them. <laughs> so you have to, you know, you have to persevere and stay with it. Sometimes they're just people you've met briefly and you're probably never going to see them again. But I'd still say, even in that case, try to do it the best you can. But, you know, you don't, you're not married to them, so you don't have to deal with them. You're not, you know, stuck with them. But at the same time, scatter those gyms out there and try to work with people on the level that they understand, you know. I'd like to say most people understand if I have a business, you shouldn't be able to come and take it away from me. Through the government, you can take it away from me through out competing me, and being more open and that kind of stuff. Then that's fair enough. But I have a right to change, and you know, and so that gives everybody a right to change and, and to change attitudes. But, Absolutely. Uh, so that's, I actually, that's the best answer I can come up with. Yeah, I, I love I love how you you put it so perfectly that um, you know we have to understand before you know before we can be understood. But more importantly, I love how you were very clear about how you ask them questions and, and bring a neutral example in like that. I've, yeah. ne I've literally never thought of that before. That's, that's, it's so incredible to, to, yeah, bring in a neutral example to where both of you are probably on the same side about, and now it's, you know, analyze it and then, and find applicable principles yeah. to, to the, to the area, the scenario in which they are totally, you know, they're, they're missing the mark. Like, I, yeah, find the common ground that you both have. And everybody has some common ground, you know, some people, everybody has a sense of right and wrong, you know. It's like, hey, wait, that's wrong. That's right. You know? So let's just get to that point. And you're right, exactly. Let's get it to a third party. Let's not talk about our particular issues. Let's put it out there and say, what if it was a, like, say, a KKK member or a Nazi, you know, whatever. You know, and some people go, oh, that's terrible. Okay, let's start there then, you know. Is he terrible because of what he's done or is he just terrible because of what he believes? Well, where, what he believes isn't something that we can necessarily do something about, you know. You know? And so let's start working from there. Absolutely. You know? And uh, I'm actually curious, uh, before, I, before I go on to the next thing I want to ask you about, you said that you were thrown out uh, of a university. Could you uh, share uh, that experience at all or not? Well, I, w I wasn't really thrown out. I was escorted uh, off campus. It wasn't – I worked on one, and I'd go to, to – uh, they'd have debate or not debates, I guess. They'd do a little presentations. And, in fact, it was a Muslim one way back when uh, – the campus I was on, uh, we educated uh, Osama bin Laden's brother, Ali, 
and uh, we had a very international campus, so we had a lot of international input. And I'm, I'm big on, <laughs> I'll just say it up front, I'm big on nationalism and sovereignty. And so they were really big on the one world stuff. And they were pushing kind of the Muslim view of things, and I went on there and uh, had some words with them. I just got shouted down that one. Uh, the other one was uh, um, a black history uh, thing they were pushing, and I gave the full, some other side of the black history uh, um, about how some blacks had their own slaves that were black and how we were already trying to get rid of it before even the war broke out and they didn't like that so I got I got escorted off campus by es uh, security because not because of necessarily what I did but because of some th death threats um, really against me I, I had to yeah wow it was basically death threat so yeah they just asked they wanted to make sure that I didn't get shot before they, I got off campus. So they at least escorted me to the you know, edge of campus and I was on my own. But yeah, I got escorted out. So Jeez. It's too bad they but, only took you to the edge of campus. I'd be like, could you walk me to my car? <laughs> yeah. Well that's what they did. They got me to the car and they actually followed my car down. But but to be fair, I got the death threats and I reported security. That's why they it wasn't that I got thrown I got booed down a lot and I was I was a pariah on campus. But it was mainly because uh, I had some credible two or three death threats. And so I figured I better get a little bit of security this time. And I just wanted them to know when I get shot, <laughs> just so you know, there's about three or four people who are threatening me. Just want you to know that this is going on. And that's when they decided they better, for a while, they, they uh, escorted me off campus at the end of the day and stuff when I went to my car. So, Wow. That's so, yeah, those people are so tolerant, you know. They've always been tolerant. <laughs> Loving and tolerant, you bigot. How, yeah. how dare you yeah. see it any other way? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Didn't you, didn't, you, didn't you hear us say we're tolerant? Come on. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Don't, don't look at what we do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like that quote that says, you know, what you do speaks so loud I can't hear what you're saying. And yeah, then, yeah, your gun in my chest kind of takes away your tolerance <laughs> argument. So anyway. Absolutely. So uh, I, I know you got you got to go soon. So I, I just want to ask uh, the last question. From your experience being involved, especially in local politics, you know, you you've uh, um, been elected to uh, to a couple of offices before. Um, yeah. What what is the relationship that you have noticed between the federal government and the state? And even more local government, like like because I've I've heard and based on things I've read um from from uh from different reports, in, especially in Utah, uh, the reason why there's so much uh, federal government encroachment in Utah, especially when it comes to um, uh, creating federal lands, is because well Utah tends is actually one of the states that gets the most amount of money from the federal government, and the reason why is because they're essentially being bought off, right? The, our elected officials on the local level are willing to take the money from the federal level and allow the federal level to do whatever it wants. It, would you say yeah, that's, that's, that's similar, or what did you notice? What oh, it's, you notice? it's totally, and that's what I'm talking about, this kind of the socialism, the federal government years ago. Uh, it's, it's basically this step, let me just draw you a quick mental diagram. You pay your taxes, you send your money to Washington, D.C., so all that money is funneled through there, both individuals and corporations. So when they take that money, they take their cut, of course, and then they send it back to the states for various projects, but they always, always send it with strings. But because of that, you paying your taxes directly to the state, you were really a citizen of the United States as an as a entity, not your state. When in the old days it used to be you were more of a, a part of your state first and you were part of the union second, based again on the constitution, the states having more rights. Yeah. Well, that was changed over time. Part of it is, uh, you're probably familiar with the, the senators who are supposed to represent only the states have been changed to a, they were supposed to be appointed by the legislatures. Yeah, that's right. And the state's interests and now, and now they're voted by popular vote, and uh, again, that democracy that shouldn't have been there. So there's things that have gone on, but you're right. It's basically the money. It really is the money. If, as the money comes in, it goes out, it has strings, and then because uh, there's two things going on. One is the money that goes out. The other thing is the federal government, through their connections and Federal Reserve and all that stuff, they have the ability to go into debt and pr produce all this money. So they can also uh, run roughshod over individuals, definitely, and even states, because they can print up all this money, and if they want to sue you, they can afford to go for years and, you know, all that stuff. So there's a certain amount of intimidation there. Wow. But let me give you an example here in my state, um, just to give you an example of that same thing you're talking about. Uh, after Obamacare went through, our state fought and fought and fought. On the local level, I was in there. We fought to keep a partly because of the uh, 
health insurance companies thought it was a good deal because everybody's going to have to be uh, insured under Obamacare, so we get all these new customers. Well, they didn't realize that there's higher uh, ideas behind that, and the whole idea is to ultimately useful idiots, you'd think they'd know, but, uh, and we're seeing ramifications of that now, a lot of them are dropping out, but what happened was they pushed and pushed and pushed in our state, and they got an exchange, okay, but the other, the bigger piece that they really wanted was uh, Medicare, Medicaid, excuse me, Medicaid funding expansion to take care of people, what that is, is that just another basically welfare program, which we already had in the state, but we fought it, and fought it, and fought it, and they never did get it passed, we uh, fought that back, uh, again, another battle I was in, but uh, we fought that back, and they didn't get it passed. And uh, so what you're seeing happening now at the federal government, they're, they're cutting back the Medicaid program, so it's going to hurt a lot of states that took it in the first place. But the point was is the people who are here because of our, quote, democracy and everything, they were getting fun, they were getting direct benefits from that. So a lot of people here were pushing and pushing. And uh, some of us with connections to some of these people gave them a lot of good arguments against it, and we were able to prevail. But um, the push... From both the uh, there's a push from the base um, uh, people, you know, just individuals because they're getting welfare, and then there's a push from the federal government. So it's from the top and the bottom, the squeezing effect that goes on, and then and caught in between is the counties, the states, and uh, and it, right. And so there's a great pressure on, and it's usually it's based on money. A lot of it's based on money, which is kind of where I'm focusing my energies going forward. I finally realized that, but. You're right, and then what happens is they get run roughshod. Uh, the Bundys, the Hammonds, uh, are classic cases where the federal government comes in, they want something uh, generally, and uh, make no mistake, that's what they're after. There's something they're after there, uh, whether it's just to take their land to have it, to complete some other project they have going or something. But the Bundys or the Hammonds have no possibility of fighting them, in the, in, first of all, in the legal system, which is not a justice system, but it's a legal system them that the government has all kinds of money and lawyers or they can just tie you up for years and years and years and uh, average citizen can't afford to fight like that so something has to give but again you're seeing it come to a head the same with the Bundys and the Hammonds you're seeing stuff come to a head here that uh, is kind of scary but at the same time you know it's a natural offshoot of what's going on based on exactly what you said the federal government's pushing 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 to the point where uh, I see the states and the counties and the localities. We're just kind of almost vassals of the of the king who's in Washington D.C. So you're exactly right. Um, that's that's what drives a lot of the agenda, including in education, which what we talked about earlier, because uh, a lot of that comes down from the top instead of from the bottom up. It comes from the top down you know, rules kind of thing. But you're right. We're caught in a in a vice, and we really, as a state, we need to look at that how we can extract ourselves. The problem is, is you've got uh, individuals on welfare that's been coming from the federal government. And I'm not talking about somebody who needs a little help. Uh, maybe they lost a job or they got, you know, need a little help in their family. That's coming. But that should have been uh, all the time. The federal government put their nose in it, and now they've got a lot of sway and a lot of – it's the old camel in the tent thing. You know, we allowed them to put their nose in pretty soon. They own the tent and we're out in the sandstorm. So yeah. – you know, you're exactly right. There's a big push, and there, there's a good question. It's a good question uh, to ask: is, Does the state and locals really have much say? You'd be surprised. I work in uh, commercial real estate and stuff down here, and I'm surprised that even our codes, uh, our uh, you know, the codes that you have to build stuff to, yeah. is, uh, comes from the top down instead of local codes. I'm really, really? you know, it's just in, it's endemic everywhere. But the big question going forward for all of us, I think, is how do we lessen the impact or the influence of both the federal government and even to some degree our state government so we can get back our individual rights? And that's probably the question. And uh, I think uh, there's going to be a two-front push on that. You're going to have to do it through money, finance, and there's there's some good things out there that are, that are in the works that might happen, and then the, the legal system. and. Uh, and working through that matter might be the only way you can do it. Because I'm not sure, the politics, you can only do so much. In our state, we do have, uh, we're probably, the, I think, the most Republican state in the uh, country, which, again, I'm not real partisan. Public and so we tend to be a little more conservative, but uh, unfortunately we're not as conservative as I think because I still see some nonsense going on with the, you know, playing footsie with the federal government. But um, 
you do need to be involved uh, to a certain level to try and push back with your politicians. Stay on them, call them if that's what it, if there's a certain issue that's important to you and one that has especially has to do with our rights. You know, we need to stay on them. They will respond. I mean, I I write petitions almost uh, petition almost weekly. Wow. And so they they do respond, and uh, uh, and I don't want to be fatalistic because I I can from my perspective I've actually seen in the state where we fought certain stuff back. Even in California, we fought some stuff back, but also at the federal level, uh, the big push for uh, amnesty. Um, several of the groups I know I was petitioning with, um, I was amazed that we actually won those. And people may not think it's a, a win because we didn't do anything, but that's the point. We didn't allow them to, to do this, uh, what do they call that, uh, redo that. Sorry, say that again. Say that again. There, but what do they call it? Com comprehensive immigration reform, oh, you yeah. heard that term. What that means is we can hide it in the details, and uh, what we, they need to do is do it piece, you know, let's work on this piece, close the borders, work on the next piece, you know, not do it comprehensive, because anyway, when they do that, they hide stuff, just like Obamacare, they hide stuff in the fine print, and that's where the danger lies, but uh, we actually held them at bay on that, uh, and I'm not crowing my own, it wasn't just me, it was a bunch of us in the nation, but I was encouraged by the amount of patriots that are out there who fought that, and they actually, even with Obama controlling Congress and him in the White House, well, they didn't get it passed. So I was really, which we have. So, I mean, I, it's you know, we talk about this stuff and how much we can do. People got to realize we can do some stuff, and what we can do, we should do. And so, you know, I encourage people to get in there and fight. And if you're getting discouraged, I understand, you know, especially getting discouraged with the parties. But, you know, I, I think we're probably right for a third party at this point, particularly what happens in the next the next year or so, if they don't get their act together, something's going to change. So. I, I yeah, I totally agree. In fact, uh, probably we should be, uh, you know, true conservative Americans should be really working on building up a third party right now. That way, it's actually strong enough to compete when it comes to the next, at least the next presidential yeah. election. You know, we can't have yeah have what we had. You know, what happened last time, which was. Um, <laughs> you know the two oh, controlled you could ever imagine in the history of America go at it <laughs> yep well you know and it's uh, it always reminds me again what the communists used to say I don't care um, you know you can vote we have votes you got you can vote between this communist or this communist <laughs> you know so <laughs> they did the show they did the show and we're kind of like that almost to a point we get to the show but there was a big pushback um, say what you will I think Don Donald Trump I didn't I'll confess I didn't vote for him. I will Neither confess I. also that going forward, going forward, I might vote for him because I like what he's doing, uh, which is refreshing. He's actually doing what he says in many cases. But um, like it or not, Donald Trump really was a repudiation of the of the of the uh, status quo. Um, he's an outsider. He's got money, and that's how people view it. Now, you and I might not agree he's constitutionally. He certainly isn't in many ways, but he does represent an outside view, and people. Um, that's actually that's, that's a good sign. There's some good signs out there. That's true. That, that's actually a very very fair depiction of of Donald Trump because you know he's just so easily demonized. And I'm personally not a Donald Trump fan, but I have been impressed at times, uh, not necessarily with his with his Twitter account, but I have been impressed with some of the um, appoint uh, uh, his appointments to certain political offices. Yeah, yeah, yep. yeah. And then some of the you know repealing some of these uh, executive orders, which is another whole conundrum. But anyway. Yeah, just what he's done. What he has done, if you actually look what he's done, it's been pretty fair. I mean, from a, even a constitutional perspective, I can't, you know, I like a lot of it. So, you know, he's done, you know, and, and, and uh, a lot of his appointees haven't gotten put through. But you know what, I just realized if they never get appointed, that means it's going to shrink. Government's got going to shrink a little bit by default. I'll take it. <laughs> you know? So I, we got to take it where we can. But really, uh, Trump was a populist. Uh, answer to the establishment. That's the way I would put it. I mean, he, again, he wasn't a strict constitutionalist, but he was a mass of people. Again, I think it's that mass of people at the gut level going, something's wrong with Washington. We want somebody from the outside to go in there and clean it up. And I think, by the way, Democrats and Republicans, I think, voted for him for that reason, because he's going to change some stuff. And again, there's that visceral level that we all understand. Even a, even a hardcore, uh, quote, liberal Democrat understands that, man, I don't know if I, I don't like this thought, you know, uh, about government t having so much power where they, they surveil our every word and and uh, stuff like that that even bothers them a little bit. Because, again, we all at that gut level know something isn't quite right. And uh, that's what you saw, I think, in this last election. Whether it continues, we'll see. 
it's a really it's a struggle between the powers that have pretty much put, them, put themselves in control for the last so many years that took them years to get there that don't want to give it up, i.e. the establishment, and the average Joe who wants something to change because it isn't working. You know, so it'll be interesting going forward. But I'm hopeful at the same time a little uh, jaded on uh, certainly on parties. I'm I'm big on the person and what do they represent or issues is more where I like to stay. Absolutely, you know? I, I totally agree. So, Absolutely agree. I'm yeah. also very jaded on parties, but yeah, maybe that's why yeah. we'll, uh, maybe that's why a third one will appear if if we play our cards right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I and mean, I guess to some degree there are some out there. The one problem you're going to have with a third party from a national level is because the powers that be two two big players here put in uh, uh, framework. Pat Buchanan complained about this when he tried to go third party. They put in framework in all these states that makes it very difficult for a third party to come in and compete on the national level, particularly. So it's going to be a fight. It's going to be a struggle, but uh, and it may take a few years, but it would be a healthy thing, I think. Absolutely. Even a fourth or fifth party, you know. So. Yeah. Anyway. Well, thank you so, so yeah, much. I want to. I want to. I want to remain hopeful after all this. I don't. I, sometimes I get a little too negative, and I, you know, I want to make sure that I sound a little hopeful because people out there, you know, got to understand. There's one judge of the whole world that's in control of all this. Whether you believe that or not, it's it's going to happen. And uh, you know, he's ultimately in control of this, and he's going to only only going to let stuff go so far. So let's do our part in uh, keeping it, you know, in the within the boundaries if we can. I agree. I just know that when, just uh, like somebody once said uh, to uh, Abraham Lincoln, I believe I heard this quote, that uh, uh, are you concerned which side, uh, uh, which side God's on in this battle? And I think Abraham Lincoln said something to the effect that I'm only, I'm not concerned about whose side he's on. I'm only concerned that I'm on his side. And I think that needs to be our watchword going forward. Just make sure we're on his side, which by the way, is all about the Constitution and common rights and and uh, laws that are applicable to all of us because we all have those rights that come from him. So he's obviously very concerned about us maintaining and keeping those rights. So absolutely, I'm, I'm interested in being on his side. I don't care about anything else but be on his side because his side is what's best for all of us. I agree. Well, thank you so much for uh, for joining me and, and being my guest for uh, for the first segment of uh, of today's episode. I, honestly, you you were not uh, too negative. On, uh, you actually filled me with hope because Good. <laughs> I, I'm very very negative myself. I'm usually just like, yep, it's all I'm very fatalistic. Just it's all going down the can, and here we go. Yeah. So, I, it's I'm easy to get that way. Really encouraged by all the examples that you shared about how you and 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 uh, other um, patriots in Idaho. Uh, we're able to really fight back against a lot of federal encroachment with, uh, you know, with uh, Obamacare and um, and uh, the uh, other welfare programs. So that was that's actually very encouraging yeah. to me because sometimes I, I I look around me and I just go I see no one who's interested in, in doing anything. Yeah, yeah. Well, the other thing too is just remember on your local level if you show up and talk to your legislator and in Utah a lot of people live right around the campus or the capital, excuse me. And to be and to be honest with you, that's one of the reasons I moved here, so I was close to the capital, so I could go and talk to them. I guess I'm more of a political animal than I thought, but um, <laughs> but when you show up to talk to them, given your perspective, they know in their mind that you're representing thousands of people who can't make it because they're working or whatever. So I don't downplay ever getting getting uh, your information to, especially your local people, because they're more sensitive to it. You know, if nothing else, just you, sh you know, whether even if you write them or email them, but even, especially if you show up. You know, because even the worst bad guy, I'm going to pass all these bad laws, but my constituent shows up, you know, and he could do something to me physically. Uh, I'll probably listen to him a little closer. <laughs> not that I advocate that. Let me make myself clear. I'm not advocating like that. But I'm just saying when somebody comes and talks to you in person, uh, not only is it effective in understanding, seeking to understand and get an understanding, but he also knows that you represent a lot of people who can't show up. So if I was to tell people if they're really – uh, you know, concerned about our situation, where to start? Start on your local level. That really is the best level, and then work backwards from there. I agree. So, that, that's thank you. Yeah, because you know, we we always set too high of a goal for ourselves, and we always get disenfranchised by how you know we can't make yeah. such a big change at at the national level. When really, it, you're right. It comes down to to starting small and then work big. Yeah, and you'll also feel better about yourself if you actually get something done on the local level. It gives you a little more impetus to go forward. Absolutely. And, uh, gives you some hope. Hope, you know. So. 
Well, thank you so much for for joining me, Daryl. Right. Um, I uh, if is there if there's any way that, you know that you want to be able to you know uh, receive questions or anything, uh, I'll just just let me know later, and I'll I'll be sure to post it to the site. I want to be able to make sure people can ask you questions because you are a, a great source of information. You have a wealth of information and experience that we can all learn from. Sure, sure, I'd be happy to answer questions. And again, questions are always good. Just remember, people, the best questions will get the best answers. So the better your question, the better the answer. Absolutely. Sure, if you'd like, however you want to do, I'm open to it. So I'm open to seeking understanding, especially with people who want to understand. God bless them, please. I mean, just keep it at it, folks. You'll get there. Well, thank you so much for being on the call, and uh, take care. Have a great day. All right. Thanks, Alex. See you later. Bye. Bye-bye. So uh, yeah, <laughs> that was a fantastic call. I I actually am filled with a lot of hope after hearing that because uh, I'll tell you probably one of the more reasons why I've been very uh, fatalistic in my own um, views about how things are going. Even though even though I have this this contradicting feeling and impression coming inside me that says you know work it on the local level is that I I actually once called my own uh, state. Uh, um, representative in the state legislator. And that was probably one of the worst, most depressing conversations I ever had. That man, I never heard a man sound so defeated and so uh, dead inside. It, it, and when I asked him about certain issues, I can't remember what issues I was asking him about, but he said essentially it was, it was just like, yeah, well, you know, we really try hard on that, but there's just, you know, it just doesn't get anywhere. I was just like, man, I don't, I, I, we're we're dead. We're done. We're we're totally done. <laughs> so I was very uh very encouraged, and filled with, filled with a lot of hope from the words that Daryl shared about uh, how you know how people actually are making a difference. They actually are making a change. So I just want to echo what he said. Really focus your efforts on on making a difference at your local level. Start in your own city. Start in your own town. But be involved. Be involved because honestly. Power hangs in the balance, and either power remains with the people or it doesn't. It goes towards the government more.